Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. I'm coming to you from very rainy New Zealand at the moment, but my host today is actually coming from the other side of the world. She's coming from the US. Her name is Merit Khan, and she is a CEO of Select Sales Development. She's an author, she's a speaker, and she is also a comedian. So lots of different facets to that personality. Welcome to the show, Merit. Well, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate the invitation to be here. No, oh, I'm looking forward to having a chat to you. Um, that is a really unusual combination. So a writer, professional speaker, comedian, sales development. Tell us a little bit about um, how Merritt got to be where she is today. Oh, my goodness. Let's see. Uh, I've always been a writer and a performer. And I think those two things were always fighting for my time and attention. And so I found a way to honor both of my passions by performing on stages and leading companies and teams in sales and leadership programs. Um, and then the comedy just kind of, you know, when you can teach something, but you can teach it with some humor, people remember it more, they share it and it, it really resonates. So sure. um, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> oh, okay. And so um, you, you do a lot of work with sales development. Tell me, what what that what is that about? Tell me a little bit about what you actually do. Well, um, my my business is really uh, focused on working with companies um, and organizations that really want to grow and serve their markets and really provide the right solutions. So. Mm -hmm. I, early in my career, was in radio advertising sales. I should back up. I should tell you that my father was in uh, advertising sales. My mom sold real estate. My my grandfather had a used car lot, and my grandmother sold Avon. So it was really... Sales is in the blood. <laughs> it was never a question of, what's Merit going to do with her life? It was more a question of, hmm, I wonder what Merit is going to sell. And mm. it turns out that I started off selling radio advertising, and because I had become a very young manager early in my career, I went out to the marketplace to find some sales training because I wasn't really skilled in that area at that time to be able to lead and help develop my team, which was one of the most important skills that a manager could provide. So I outsourced that part. But in the course of doing that, I, I got some great leadership and manager and sales training. And then when the radio station was on the chopping block to be sold, uh, not because we weren't good at what we do, but because that's how you make money in radio, um, yeah. we I, I decided that it would be a good career move to actually work for the company that did our sales training. And so I did that for a number of years and then decided, well, I, I think I could build a better mousetrap as most entrepreneurs do. <laughs> yes. And that's what happened. Perfect. Okay. And so it's interesting. I know that um, for a lot of business owners, uh, sales can be a little bit nerve wracking, a little bit scary, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you overcome that fear. Well, I think the challenge is that most entrepreneurs open their business because they're very good at what they do. In fact, they're so good at what they do, they've earned the right to do this for themselves. The mm -hmm. problem is, what they don't realize is, or they don't realize early enough, is that it's really not good enough to be just good at what you do. You have to yeah. be great at getting the business. And what's frustrating is that the guy or the gal down the hall is maybe not as good a service provider, you know, not as good in terms of their expertise, delivery, but yeah. better at marketing and sales. And so um, that's where it becomes very frustrating for entrepreneurs. And when I you know, share with them when I come along with my little program and they realize that, look, it, all of these things can be learned, you know, just like you learn to get good at the services and the expertise that you have, you can learn the the techniques 
in that will make you better at developing business. And I think the most important thing is to keep your focus on solving problems for other people. The challenge, the, the, the biggest challenge is to make sure that you're not giving away all of your expertise to use your expertise so that you are able to ask the best questions so that people really understand that you have something of value to share. That's actually really good. So when you, yeah, you don't want to um, completely solve their problem by giving away all the expertise, right. but show them that you know enough that you can actually help them because that you need exactly. to help them solve their problems. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you've done a lot of work around emotional intelligence, haven't you? I have done a lot of work around emotional intelligence. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell us, I mean, how does that sort of fit into what you're doing? And, and does that have a, a part to play in the whole comedy thing as well? I just wonder how those are interlinked. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, you know, emotional intelligence was really a game changer for the, the training, coaching, consulting work I've been doing with entrepreneurs and, and businesses because you know, it, you can know all of the right things to say and do, but if you have a mindset that is not supportive of you implementing all of those things you know to say and do, you're going to be in, you're going to end up working against yourself, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really important in terms of making sure that you have a solid foundation upon which you're building the strong strengths and skills that you're learning in a program like mine, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I learned that tr even when I was training and coaching people or, you know, which I still do, I had to adjust my approach to meet the profile that somebody has. So for example, if you uh, don't have a strong impulse control as an example, right? If somebody mm -hmm. asks you a question in a sales conversation, then you are more likely to just answer it as opposed to ask a better question to find out what they're really getting at, to find out what their challenge really is. And so when I work with somebody who doesn't have impulse control, I'm first giving them some language to use that will help them put a pause on answering the question so that they can get the real question and answer that. I'm intrigued myself. I'm just thinking that I can see that I've got some challenges of myself being a little bit ADHD, but I'm also, I know that I, when I work with a lot of men, um, men are very much kind of solutions focused and want to jump in and want to provide an answer. And I try and encourage them, encourage them through the EOS process to, to ask more inquisitive questions and try and get to the real root cause of what's going on rather than trying to jump in and solve things straight away. Um, is it, is it just men or is it, is that just my perception? Maybe there's a, it, it's more around personalities? You know, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I, my personal philosophy, and yes, there's some, diff, there's some definite differences in, you know, in gender, yeah. in, in gen, just in general with, between the, the two genders. But I, I tend to look a little bit more beyond that because there are certainly mm -hmm. women that are very focused on the bottom line. Yeah. When I can look you know, the, the perfect world is when I can do an emotional intelligence assessment prior to coaching somebody. And then I'm coaching to the profile that I see, regardless mm -hmm. of the packaging that it comes in. Yeah. And I think that really kind of takes some of the, the stereotypes out of play, which allows me to cut to the chase for each client and really meet them where they are and how they need to, to learn. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I impress upon all of my clients is the idea that questions change outcomes. And if you want someone to really um, appreciate you as an expert, appreciate and be able to hear and be open to the solutions that you have the very first thing you want to do is not, you know, come at them with all of this, you know, intense, like, I'm so great. I've got this. I've, I'll solve your problem. You, you don't want to, you don't want to push it on, push yourself or your solutions on somebody. You want them to relax and make the decision for themselves. So um, you really want them to select you. In fact, the, the training arm of my business is called Select Sales Development. Mm -hmm. And we spell it S-E-L-L-E-C-T, not because we don't know how to spell the word select, Deborah, <laughs> but, but because we actually want people to stop selling and start getting selected. 
And so in order to be selected, you have to ask somebody good questions so that they figure out for themselves they want what you have. Mm. And there's certainly an element of kind of building trust and rapport before we even get into solving solving their problems, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is where the comedy comes in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how, how do you use the comedy in your um, sales training? <laughs> you know, I, I think people want to laugh, right? Comedy yeah. is a great equalizer. It, you know, when you can help somebody laugh they're more relaxed, right? There's a lot of research that shows, you know, laughter is good, right? The, the, mm. That old expression, like laughter makes the best medicine, you know, I'm not sure about that. If you were in a car accident, I don't want the <laughs> ambulance drivers like coming over and cracking jokes. I want them to hook me up with an IV. Let's go. <laughs> but I do think that, you know, laughter just, <clears throat> it, it lessens the stress so when we are feeling stressed, we are less likely to be open and to have all of the, the neurons firing in our brains that allow us to, to come up with new solutions or be able to hear solutions when they're presented to us. Mm -hmm. So if I can use humor as a tool in my training to help people reduce the stress, be present in the room, relax and have a good time, they're they're more receptive to the good lessons that are going to come in this program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in that respect, uh, studying and really being a, a practitioner and, and now a professional comedian has really helped set aside the programs that I deliver because people enjoy going to them, yeah. you know, like who doesn't want to laugh? <laughs> it's absolutely true. I'm actually very fortunate. I've got a friend who owns an improv theatre just around the Ooh. corner here in Ponsonby, um, and we often go there. And we just love. I mean, I, I don't actually do the improv, but I go and watch it regularly, and I really enjoy it. But it brings me to the question: Do you think that comedy can be taught, or is it something that is naturally inherent in a person? I think, like anything, there's people that are going to have some natural skills. It's hard to teach timing, but mm. I have seen people learn it. Mm. Um, you know, like. You know, you could probably teach me basketball, but I'm five foot nothing. And, you know, I'm not, there's a, my natural skills are probably not available, but you could teach me how to shoot a free throw and you could teach me how to block and guard and all those things. Um, I do think, I mean, I, when I took a, a comedy workshop back in 2014, I didn't know the structure of a joke. I didn't Ooh. know the the element like how to use a pause and I didn't well I I, di I knew a little bit about that from my professional speaking because at that point I'd done I'd been a speaker for more than a decade but mm -hmm. but how to craft a tight joke is definitely a skill that I learned and there are definitely questions that I was taught as a comedian to ask about every situation so now you know, I, for, for the example, a couple of weeks ago, I got a speeding ticket and it was, it was deserved. <laughs> it was, it was well earned. Um, not proud of that, but that's the truth. Uh, and so, you know, initially I'm upset, right? Like, darn, you get caught, right? Like, ah, oh, and you're upset. And it's like, oh, I didn't want to spend this money. And then I thought, all right, well, as long as I have to spend $175 on the speeding ticket, uh, how am I going to turn that into money? How am I going to make a couple of good jokes that are going to get me some more stages just, you know, from this experience? And so you learn to ask yourself questions like, what's funny about this? What's embarrassing about this? What's unusual that has me observe, like how I'm observing this, right? And so, you know, there were things that came out of it. I haven't written the joke yet, but I'm, <laughs> I think that the the whole point is they say that tragedy plus time equals comedy. And from my perspective, no one said it had to take a long time. Mm -hmm. So my worldview really is how quickly can I get to the comedy? Mm -hmm. How quickly can I find what's funny about this? And, you know, there's, there's plenty of examples in, as an entrepreneur to find the funny in situations that would otherwise be stressful.
And, and I think it's the only way I can cope with it personally. I mean, I, I've, I've had some pretty major sort of tragedies in the business and I've had to just, I mean, at the time, yeah, of course it was devastating, but you have to look back and just laugh at it. And now I use it when I'm working with EOS clients. You know, I talk about, I talk about finances particularly because I talk about where we are, um, the delegate and elevate, you know, where our God given talent is, what we're really, really good at. And in that bottom right hand quadrant, which is the stuff that you're not good at and that you don't like is accounting for me. I, it's just not in my nature. I have zero desire to do it. I understand it. I get it, but I don't like to do it. And I always laugh and joke when I'm talking to them about that stuff because I ran an event center for many, many years and it got closed down due to COVID. And when we actually closed it down, we had something like $30,000 worth of overdue invoices that had never gone out because I was ultimately the person who was supposed to be accountable for finances. I'm not a finance person. So, it's, you know, and I think when you look back on it, I can laugh at it. At the time, maybe not quite so much, but, you know, that's, yeah, you've got to well, laugh. You and I are wired exactly the same. <laughs> that, that was my, that was my Achilles heel too. And I had, I had to learn the hard way about uh, accounts receivable. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think also, I mean, one of the things I just picked up from what we're talking about is that even in comedy, there's actually a process, right? Yeah. So it's a little bit like um, selling has a process, people have a pro. everything in the US we talk about process, but comedy actually has a process. I mean, yes, it doesn't mean that because you follow the process, you'll naturally be hugely funny, but there is certainly a way of approaching it that can be replicated, I suppose. And I think there were a lot of lessons that I learned from the business world, sales in particular, that helped mm -hmm. me in comedy in ways that I couldn't have known uh, otherwise, right? So, for example, um, in sale, you know, sales 101, you are taught, you know, know your buyer, right? Like, you have to understand certain things about the buying persona so that mm -hmm. you can adjust your approach, not so that you can, you know, be what they need and like, you know, be wishy-washy, but so that you can really speak their language. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of things, you know, your audience is probably familiar of, you know, like disc profiles and behavioral based assessments and things like that, that you can, you know, just so you can understand who you're talking with. Are they bottom line? Are they story? Are they numbers oriented? Right? Like all those different things. Yeah. Well, in comedy, I could do the same exact comedy set for two very different audiences and one is going to go crazy for it. And mm. another one would be like, eh, that was okay. You know? Mm. And so the difference is that, uh, so for example, um, I did a set in uh, Toronto, Canada one, uh, this was back in 20, 2016, I think it was. And at that time I was going through a difficult divorce and all my jokes were about my, my terrible marriage and, you know, my, difficult spouse and all of that. Well, I did this comedy set at about 1030 at night on a Wednesday in downtown Toronto. Hmm. Now, think about that. Who do you think is in the audience at 1030 at night in, in downtown? They were not the people who have been married for 10 years. They were young 20 cent somethings dating, right? Like they couldn't relate to my, my jokes at that time. I didn't have enough of a range to look at the audience, to think intelligently. I wonder who's here at 1030 on a Wednesday night. Um, and so I learned the hard way that it was important to pick the right set that would appeal best to that audience. And, you know, I think I learned that from the sales world, but it became really obvious to me on that comedy stage. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons, isn't there, between the two that you can actually apply, which is fantastic. Um, I was reading your profile that, that, that your agency sent through, and I have to say there was one sort of um, little bullet point that really caught my attention. There was three magic questions to transform what's possible. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is, what those three magic questions are? Well, um, you know, there's there's actually... I think maybe I need to update that. There's probably just one magic question now. <laughs> so, um, and it, it really comes, well, okay, let me just say it this way. Mm. When I, the first thing that I used to teach people in a sales or leadership program was, you know, what to say, right? Like, what do you say yeah. to be effective with somebody? And, and how are you, you know, how can you match your solutions to their pains, right? So those are all sort of very 
you know, uh, standard things that you would expect in a, in a training program. What I didn't realize early enough in my career, and sometimes I feel like I should pick up the phone and call all of those early clients and be like, wait, wait, there was one other thing. Um, I realized that the first step to a closed deal is always an open mind. And once I figured that out, I realized that what I first had to do before I could get anybody to before anybody really kind of implemented some of the good questioning and the rapport skills and all the other things that I was teaching them in a, in a course, mm -hmm. I really had to help them open them, open their minds first as to a new possibility and then open the mind of the person next to them that they're trying to be influential with, not in a manipulative way, but just, you know, I can't solve your problem if you're not open to hearing a solution. Yeah. And so you know, I, it, there's, I tried to make it fancier and more complicated and, you know, and like sexy, but the truth is it, it's really four words. And basically it boils down to asking the question, are you open to? Mm -hmm. And when I ask something like, well, you know, let me tell you why this works. Yeah, please. First of all, most of us want to be perceived as open-minded. So a lot of times I'll ask an audience in a keynote um, program, you know, how many of you are, would consider yourself open-minded? And everybody raises their hand. I go, all right, well, how many of you consider yourselves to be more open-minded than the average person? And a couple hands go down, but most of the hands still stay up. Okay, great. Um, I, you know, and, and then I ask, well, how many of you know somebody who is not open-minded, <laughs> right? And everybody raises their hand. Yeah. So, you know, you and I have established we're not great at the accounting side of things. So uh, I don't know, math is not my super strength, but I do know that 95% of us cannot be better than the average. That one I know. <laughs> and there was a study done in Pepperdine University a number of years ago, and they asked those questions, and they found that 95% of people do think that they are more open-minded than the average person. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, we all, the, the thing is, we all want to be perceived as open. So if we tap into that, if I were to ask you, hey, are you interested in hearing about the programs I lead for conferences? And are you interested in hearing more about my one woman show? It would be very easy for you to say, um, no, thanks, not mm -hmm. interested. And yeah. you can still sleep at night. You're a very nice person. Like you are losing no sleep over telling me you're not interested. But it would be a little bit harder for you to say, you know, if I said, hey, Deborah, are you open to hearing a little bit about the work that I, the programs that I lead for conferences and events? And would you be open to hearing about my one woman show? And it'd be much harder for you to say, no, I'm not open no, to that. I'm not open. Because <laughs> that says something about who you are, right? That says something about, about how you're wired. And we don't want to admit that we're not open. So it's, it's not like, so that's why are mm -hmm. you open to is a great short phrase works for everything. Uh, it has been known to even work on teenagers in certain situations. <laughs> so um, that would be my my magic phrase. Oh, that's you know, too. <laughs> yeah, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that completely repositions that entire question. And yes, it puts it back on the person. Okay, brilliant. Oh, wow. Um, to help now, comedy. So the other thing is, you know, you have got a um, a basement comedy stage, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, that was kind of a fluke. I was rehearsing my one woman show with my director in New York and I'm in Colorado. So I had my set, all my costumes, props, everything set up in my basement and uh, with my laptop on Zoom and we were rehearsing. One day we had this fantastic run through and I said, gosh, it's a shame that nobody's here. Nobody else saw that. That was a, that was a killer performance. Um, and she said, you know, like, yeah, you, you should probably put some tables and chairs in your basement. And I was like, huh, that's maybe, maybe I will. 
Um, well, then it got out of hand, as most things that I get involved with do. Um, and uh, the next thing I knew, I, I had a carpenter friend build a stage and I had a, you know, a, a guy who's done the AV for a very big comfort, uh, concert hall out here. Uh, Red Rocks actually, um, you know, installed lights and a sound system for me. And I bought professional mics and the whole bit and seating for 52. And now I have comedy shows in my basement. So it's fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. So how many can you actually seat down there? Uh, I can seat 52 and wow. then I've got sort of this like sort of side green room area for all the comedians to sit on these nice couches next to it and see the show. But, um, you know, it, it, I live in a neighborhood, right? In the suburbs. And so I have to kind of do it a little bit on the down low. I don't want to upset any of my neighbors and mm -hmm. you know, it's not really a business because you can't run a business like this out of your house, but you know, it runs on suggested donations so that my comedians get paid. Cause I do believe in paying for talent and everybody yep. just brings, you know, brings their own, whatever they want to enjoy as a beverage. And mm -hmm. you know, we have fun nights. That sounds super cool. <laughs> Good. Now, I would be remiss of me because we actually spoke before the actual podcast and you said that you are a big EOS fan. And obviously yes. my my um, listeners know that I am a big EOS advocate. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey with EOS and, and why you d even decided to take on board EOS? Uh, yeah, I, I really love the EOS system. I, I read all the books in the, <laughs> in the category. Um, what I, what I think most, um, you know, shifted for me by learning it was that, you know, I really ran my business for so many years as a lone ranger, right? Like I'm a visionary. I can be the implementer when I have to. Um, and I have those skills and as most entrepreneurs can kind of ride both of those, uh, you know, sections of, of yeah. your brain. But I, I would get distracted, right? A visionary is coming up with so many ideas. And really, once I understood the distinction between a visionary and an implementer and how those two um, styles can really support each other and, I, you know, I just got so much farther. I worked with an implementer um, for two, more than two years. And every Monday we would meet at noon and he would basically tell me all the the ideas that I wasn't allowed to do. We had our <laughs> L10 meetings, but I loved having the structure of it, right? Because right. for years I would get in on a Monday morning and I would, you know, be overwhelmed by all the things there were to do. I didn't have my, my priorities for the quarter really clear. I didn't, um, I didn't have a good system to process issues and learning that L10 structure was super helpful for me and in terms of being able to say, nope, this is a good idea, but I'm going to park this for later because, you know, these, these are my, my priorities. And it just, you know, even as an entrepreneur, I mean, I'm not the ideal, personally, I'm not the ideal client for EOS just because mm -hmm. it was really just me. I didn't have the team, but even that accountability, um, uh, chart, you don't call it that, right? Well, yeah, no, accountability chart, you're right. Accountability yeah. chart, yeah, that is yeah. the right language. You know, when I saw my name in all the boxes, I was like, oh, something's got to change. But then I was able to see, oh, okay, I can outsource this one. I can, you know, this one really should be an employee. This one could be a contractor. Like, you yeah. know, this one doesn't need to be full-time, right? So I was able to see my business from a, vi a very different vantage point than I really ever had. And um, it was a game changer for me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, the, I think the accountability chart, it, it does. When you start seeing your name against all the boxes, it's it's a bit of a wake up call because you realize why you feel like you're completely overwhelmed and you can't do everything. And I think, that, you know, yes, obviously for us as implementers, we work with much bigger companies. But I mean, in my own business, there's only actually two of us and a couple of outsource people. And still, like, ha not if when I wasn't having level 10s, it was very easy to put your head in the sand, ignore things, um, try and juggle all the balls, keep everything up in the air. Uh, but when you've got that level 10 meeting and that accountability, there's, there's no escape. <laughs> it becomes pretty obvious what the yeah. issues are, what you need to do, where the focus needs to be. It's pretty cool. Exactly. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, I always ask our guests to give us kind of three top tips or tools. You've always been already been very generous in terms of sharing that magic question. What else would you like to share? What are the three things you'd love other people to know um, that will help in their business? I think some of the things that I share with my business audiences, number one, um, questions change outcomes. So, you know, really play with that question. Are you open to and just see how it shifts somebody else's response and their ability to really hear the solutions that you provide. So that would be my first thing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I would recommend to people is just uh, I think it's really valuable to have more information about your own wiring. You know, I was taught early on, if you want to be successful in sales or leadership, learn everything you can about other people. Yeah. And I think that's good advice to a point. But what it left out was one of those other people is should actually be yourself. Yeah. So everything, every little nook and cranny you can learn about yourself and how you're how you process how your what your worldview is and the foundation that you're layering all of the training that you get and all of the experiences that you have on top of is super important. So I'm a little bit biased, but as an emotional intelligence certified coach for more than a dozen years, I really think there's a lot of value there. And so I would highly recommend to people that they find a, a certified coach using a validated assessment tool like me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, in a couple of coaching sessions, you just get a lot that spills over into really every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. I would say the third thing is get a little bit more laughter in your life. Go see comedy, whether you like improv or stand up or, you know, something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's uh, come see my theater show if, if that's available to you or, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's just it's fun. I think I think, you know, laughter lightens the load you hold. So especially if you're feeling stressed out and you can't imagine going outside and, you know, like you're too stressed to be entertained, that's exactly when you need a little comedy in your life. Perfect. So a couple of questions for you for you. First of all, where are your shows? Where can somebody come and see you if you're doing you know, doing your comedy, first of all? Yeah, well, right now uh, I'm uh, about, like, setting up tours for the U.S. and I set up my tours in a, in a kind of a unique way from other performances. I book my keynotes at conferences because oh, yeah. that's the, the you know, the, the bigger revenue stream in my business right now. And once I'm there, I will put together a show. So either a theater um, hires me to bring my show to them or mm -hmm. I rent the theater and produce it all myself. Um, so you know, if you are thinking, oh, that would be kind of interesting. We'd like to, we'd like to have her at our theater. I am happy to get on a plane. And by the way, New Zealand's one of my favorite places on the planet. Been there three times. So have you? Uh, Gosh, yeah, American has been to New Zealand. Woohoo! That's exciting. Uh, love it, love it, love <laughs> most it. Of my, love most it. of my guests say, oh, you know, you, I, I really want to come to New Zealand. I keep going, well, why don't you? Oh, it's such a long way. And I say to them, I came to Dallas for a two-day conference in January. If I can come to Dallas for a two-day conference, I'm pretty certain you can come here for a three or four-week holiday or two-week right. holiday. Doesn't matter, just make it happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm a huge fan, so I'm happy to get on a plane and and come perform for you wherever you need. But the best the best place to find me and to get on the list for mm -hmm. upcoming shows and announcements. I also do workshops around the experiences and the lessons from my show that apply and can help people rewrite their past to rewire their future which is Ooh. kind of a theme of my show. I basically, my show is my life story as told through the lens of comedy. And so there's a lot of rich lessons that I share with my business audiences and my theater audiences. And uh, and now I'll be delivering workshops so that people can find the lessons in their own life. Um, so that uh, the hub of all things is my, my name. My website is uh, meritcon.com. So M-E-R-I-T-K-A-H-N.com. And there you can find out about all three of the types of stages that I perform on and mm -hmm. how we can connect. Perfect. And tell me just very quickly a little bit about your keynote speaking. So what is it that you um, do for, um, I'm assuming it's for companies who are looking to um, have some inspiration, some motivation, uh, a bit of learning? What? Tell me a bit about that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I have a training background, so I have lots of content and I can go very deep. And oftentimes when I'm invited to uh, perform at a conference or for a company, 
I'm actually doing a keynote and a breakout session. So okay. in the keynote will will be fun and inspiring and there'll be laughter and it'll be very entertaining and also very interactive. So what I actually do is I take stories from my show and I bring some of the costumes and props to make it a little bit more fun. Um, and I, and then we unpack, I take, I take people in a sort of let's peek behind the curtain. How does that story relate to you as a leader? Um, what are you pulling out of that for you? Right. And so it's a, it's a really fun, I, I tell several stories and then we have all these interactions and people leave going, wow, that was the most unique uh, keynote experience I've had. And the time flies by and the lessons are sticky and people really love it. And then in a breakout session, I'm like, all right, we did the entertaining thing. Let's roll up our sleeves. Now let's, let's do some, some deep work so that we can, you, you have something that you can really implement and take back to your teams. And um, you have a lot of, uh, you have a, a deeper knowledge about some of the things that we started talking about in the, in the keynote. So sometimes I, well, actually in a couple of weeks, I'm doing the breakout session first and then I'm the closing keynoter and that works really well too. So cool. Okay, perfect. Well, look, so that was MeritKahn.com, so M-E-I-R-T-K-A-H-N.com, um, and that's got all of the information on the comedy, on the keynote speaking, on the workshops, and, of course, about yourself as well. So um, please do go and visit that. Hey, Merit, look, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, thank you, and thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your wisdom and a bit of humour to make us all <laughs> happier. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a the life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.